Uh, welcome to Prime Time and our session on the business implications for financial services. My name is Camilla McPherson. I'm Head of Secretariat for Prime Finance. Before we get underway, I wanted to let you know that the session is being recorded and will be distributed later. Attendees are muted and have their videos turned off. If you have a question or comment, we'd love to hear from you. Please use the Q&A function to get in touch. It can be helpful to include your name and affiliation. We'll be using the chat box to send messages to all attendees in the course of this session. Thank you so much to Dwarf Financial Technologies and FTI Consulting for sponsoring this series of Prime Time. Thank you also to LexisNexis for support with promotion. I'd now like to introduce Rick Grove, who's moderating today's session. Rick is Chief Executive Officer and a partner at Rutter Associates in New York. He's a former fixed income and commodity derivatives executive at Bank of America and Paribas Capital Markets. He's also a former chief executive officer at ISDA and a former lawyer at Cravath, Swain and Moore in New York and London. Finally, he's a prime finance expert and a member of the Prime Finance Management Board. Rick, let me pass over to you. Thank you very much, Camilla, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from all around the globe. A warm welcome to all of you. I am truly delighted to be moderating today's discussion. As Camilla mentioned, it was my privilege to serve as ISDA's CEO and an important period in the development of the OTC derivatives market. A time when the market, which was global from its inception, um, was expanding rapidly throughout the world. And ISDA was expanding as a reflection of this global growth. It was my pleasure during that time to work closely with the two members of today's panel. During that time, the three of us spoke almost daily. And while we've kept in touch over the intervening years, this is the first time in quite a while that the three of us have gotten together for a chat. The subject of our discussion today will be the implications of Brexit for the financial services business. I expect my two colleagues with their years of experience, both in the business and as regulators, and with their current very relevant vantage points to provide some interesting insights uh, into the impact that Brexit has had, is having, and will have on the financial services business, and to highlight some of the many yet to be determined implications of Brexit. We intend for our program to be a conversation today, first among the three of us, and then as those of you in the audience raise questions, to include you as well. We expect to save at least the last 15 to 20 minutes of this one hour program for questions from the audience. And I encourage you to set them out in the chat box as early in our program as you would like. Now it's my privilege to introduce our panelists. Gay Huey Evans is chairman of the London Metal Exchange and also serves on the boards of Standard Chartered, ConocoPhillips, IHS Market, and HM Treasury. Gay began her career at Payne Weber before joining Bankers Trust in New York, where she became a leader in the early days of the OTC derivatives business and served several years as chair of the ISDA Board of Directors. Gay then went on to serve as director of the markets division for the UK Financial Services Authority before assuming senior roles at Citi and Barclays. And Gay is a prime finance expert. Matthew Elderfield is chief risk officer and head of group risk and compliance at Nordea Bank and is a member of Nordea's executive management team. Earlier in his career, Matthew served as the first head of ISDA's European office in London before moving to the UK Financial Services Authority, where he had several supervisory responsibilities. Matthew then went on to serve as chief executive of the Bermuda Monetary Authority, and then deputy governor and head of financial regulation of the Central Bank of Ireland, before taking a position as global head of compliance for Lloyds Banking Group, and then joining Nordea. Thank you both for joining us today. I'd like to address the first of my questions to, to Gay Evans. So Gay, you've witnessed tremendous growth and innovation in the financial markets um, during the course of your career. 
Perhaps most notable is the growth and innovation in the OTC derivatives market, in which you've played uh, many important roles right from the outset. How crucial was it for the development of the OTC derivatives market, and in particular, for the liquidity, which has been a hallmark of the OTC derivatives market, that OTC derivatives were traded in a global marketplace with relatively few jurisdictional boundaries? Well, uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Prime, for inviting me today. And I don't know if that's Rick's way of saying that I've been around a long time and I've got a lot of gray hairs, but <laughs> it's probably true. Um, I also want to say I've looked at the list of uh, participants today, so it's nice to have to, to see so many old colleagues and friends from my derivatives days on this call, so so thank you and welcome for the support. And I have to say also up front that I had the pleasure of hiring both Rick and Matthew to their executive positions at ISDA. So we go back a long ways. And that doesn't, it seems like yesterday in some ways, but really it was like 25 years ago. At least. So um, let me say memory lane. I could probably take you back a long, long ways, but I won't. I'll just go to start with the 80s. Um, Back then, derivatives were bespoke, back-to-back -back transactions, even upfront fees. But we all had to do our own legal documents, which was the origination of ISDA for many of you. They really were um, an asset liability tool. They, they hedged loans. They were there to hedge debt issuances. They were there to hedge exchange rate exposures. I mean, they really, we really felt like the world was a safer place with derivatives. That was the, the early days. We ran global books. North America, even though we had operations all throughout the US and Canada and elsewhere, they were run out of New York. We had operations in Europe, everywhere. You know, back in the days of the Lira, the George Frank, the French Frank, the Swiss Frank, the Pesetas. But they were run out of London. We had books in Asia. It was a bit different. Most of it was out of Japan. And there were yen markets, but they were run out of and so that was a fascinating time, but we did, we ran them because the efficiencies of having one single place to run books, the risk management of books. And, and that's when they were much smaller because you look at the notional growth of the notional value of the outstanding OTC derivatives market back then was in the billions. Now we're talking, I looked at the number December, 2020, it's 607 billion. That's a huge amount of growth. We thought we were experiencing growth in the 80s and 90s. I think when I left is uh, it was about, about just short of 50 trillion, and that was in 98, 1998. But I think what's what we've seen, I talk about these global books, is because I moved to the UK in 1991. Uh, passporting did not exist. We had to have licenses in each country, and each country had its own rules and regulations. And so, and we had to interpret it, interpret some of those rules because they didn't all account for derivatives at that time. So, as we know, over time, the EU comes together and all the states have harmonized these rules for many products and services to facilitate financial transactions. And so we've created common standards across Europe and the UK, which of course part of that. <laughs> um, and so I have to say um, that was a better place to be. But in the meantime, many people came that were in the jurisdictions, the regional jurisdictions, they did come to London. That was prior to this common harmonization of rules. So uh, having lived through that, and now that we've got to go back to it, I think when we, this is why I thought it was relevant to talk about it. We've slightly been there, um, but we'll get into that question more in detail because you just asked me to go down memory lane. So I think when you look at the derivatives growth, I think one thing we have to bear in mind through this conversation is when we're talking about a short of a six, well, $600 trillion market, how do you manage that efficiently? How do you hedge that efficiently? How do you have the legal certainty that we all need and work so hard to get in the 80s and 90s for these documents? How do you get the transparency of what people are doing, the conduct issues, as we've seen? We thought derivatives made the world a better place, but later on you would see headlines that basically derivatives were toxic and didn't make the world a better place. And you know, they were nuclear developments. 
Well, it's the conduct of individuals that's important, and we need to maintain that. So how do you pull all together when we're talking a world where we have to diversify our books once again? So in a nutshell, that's kind of a little, 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 little talk about memory lane that I could probably go on. We could be here for days. So I'll turn it back to you, Brett. Thanks. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Gay. And I'm going to ask both of my co-panelists, if they could, to mute while they're, um, uh, while they're not on, um, and, and anybody else on the call as well. Uh, but Gay, that's a perfect lead into my next question, which is, is for Matthew. Um, and Matthew, while the OTC market was global right from its inception in the 1980s, as Gay and I have both uh, mentioned, and while most dealers in the market were subject to prudential regulation, the market itself was largely unregulated. And it wasn't until the global financial crisis of 2007-2009 that regulators working through the G20 and other multilateral bodies imposed a global framework of regulation on the market. One important aspect of this framework was a requirement that a substantial portion of OTC derivatives be subject to clearing in order to mitigate credit risk. Since then, the largest centers for clearing have been in the UK and in the United States. The Brexit withdrawal agreement and the Brexit trade and cooperation agreement have resulted in what is essentially a no deal Brexit for financial services. So what are the implications of this for the continuation of OTC derivatives clearing in London which is where the vast majority of euro denominated derivatives are cleared. Thanks very much, uh, Rick, and, and thanks so much to you and to Topic and all the rest of the old is the gang for the invitation. It's such a great pleasure to be on a panel with you and Gay again. I was trying to count back to the last time I ended up going to 20 years or more older. I thought I should stop counting at that point. Um, but uh, it's good to be here in a, in a personal capacity. And I think you, you set the context and the scene right that there was a big wave of new regulation that came after the global financial crisis. But if we're going down memory lane, let's not forget, as, as you said, that derivatives were regulated for prudential capital purposes for banks, maybe the notorious exception that was uh, AIG, who was were subject to regulation by well um, uh, supervised uh, entities. Um, also, I think, you know, well, there was the, some of the excesses, as Gay was talking about, of some very over engineered products. Um, it was certainly the case that uh, the uh, settlement procedures under the ISDA contracts worked very well in the financial crisis. That said, the big part of regulation, as you mentioned, was about clearing and margining arrangements. And I think that was a welcome part of the improving financial stability, improving uh, financial regulation. To be fair, is there was an advocate of clearing back in the day, um, and there was some inertia for that. So we needed that regulatory action to take place. So now we have clearing as a sort of core component, but as you say, Brexit is threatening it if you like, in the way it's working cross-border, uh, because there's a, a debate in Europe about whether clearing for Eurozone instruments has to be in the Eurozone, and also whether the LCH is allowed to have um, uh, equivalents. Now, there's a history to this. Um, previously, the ECB and the uh, European Commission has argued that all CCPs must be based in the actual eurozone. Is there a strong argument for that? There's a kind of prudential basis for it, but I'm a bit skeptical, to be honest. And, and I have to admit, I've, I've got maybe a conflict of interest, as does Gay, because both Gay and I used to regulate the London Clearinghouse back in the days of old. And uh, I think the LCH... Lost, hello? I've lost them. Totally lost them. That's totally died. Matthew, okay. we are we're we're hearing you, but you're breaking up. I'm just going to interrupt, Matthew. Um, yep. Can, can you join us by audio? I think it would be better. You are breaking up from time to time, so if you could uh, join us by by, will, by phone, that would I be. Will, I would do that. And and then just Sorry. and then just retrace I'll your steps a little a bit. Yep. Yep. Just retrace your steps because you're you're talking about an important point.
Ma Matthew, I'm not hearing you at the moment. If you could dial dial back in. And I don't want to lose I don't want to lose your comments because what Matthew is talking about is one of the critical, most central points in in this in this whole issue. But Matthew, we're still uh, still not hearing you. Still not hearing you, Matthew. Hello. Yeah, now we can hear you. Go ahead. I do apologize to everybody for that. Uh, the pleasures of doing uh, Zoom from home offices. So um, I was just talking about the European um, arguments and discussions around this, which has been to saying that there's a in theory, a financial stability or a prudential argument that clearing of Eurozone instruments must be in the Eurozone itself. My personal view, as I was saying, is to be skeptical of that argument because I think the standards of regulation of the London Clearinghouse are very high. As I was saying, maybe from a personal point of view, Gay and I both actually supervised the LCH when we were working for the Financial Services Authority and very robust levels of regulation. And, and really, you know, since then, standards have risen for clearing houses, but the, um, the UK regulation has matched that. And I think if there was what I call a, a technical equivalence assessment of UK regulation and of the uh, LCH or CCP supervision, the UK would be bound to meet that. Of course, the standards in the UK and the EU are at the same right now. So I'm, I'm skeptical ab about there being a, a, a financial stability argument not to recognize the LCH for equivalence. But we're in a political process in Brexit. Sometimes politics has trumped reason and uh, common sense. And now I think we're in a situation where the European Commission has signaled quite strongly that the temporary equivalence for the uh, UK uh, central counterparties is going to expire, expire in June uh, 22. And you might have caught the fact that the Commission has uh, set up a working group at the beginning of this year involving all the European um, uh, supervisory agencies like the EBA and ESMA, the European Central Bank is there. They held their first meeting in the end of February. And they basically have a, a clear uh, objective to reduce reliance on the UK central counterparties to see what impediments there are to the transfer of um, positions across to Eurex or into the Eurozone. And, and they've got an agenda to say, uh, you know, can you get rid of the fragmentation? Will the liquidity be split? Is there a way to facilitate the transfer of positions? Um, how do you deal with outstanding transactions? Um, you know, what are, what are clients preferring? And, um, you know, should you be forced to novate and repaper transactions, which I think would be very burdensome. So we're in a situation now where I think that central plank of regulation you mentioned, Rick, um, having clearing is now being caught up in the Brexit debate. And I suspect, I hope it's not the case, but I suspect that a technical equivalence assessment by ESMA of the London Clearinghouse isn't going to be enough. And there's a, a policy objective by the European Commission to transfer positions um, uh, into the Eurozone. And I hope that's done in a way that the market understands the rules of the game to minimize fragmentation, minimize uh, costs, and takes uh, account of the complexity of the exercise and the risk of doing that. Back to you, Rick. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. Thanks for sorting out our technical difficulties as well, um, because those are very important points that you've you've raised and you've touched upon aspects of the Brexit. Uh, debate for financial services um, that are are very much salient uh, issues. You've talked about uh, the importance for markets. You've talked about fragmentation, liquidity. Um, what's what's required for uh, for capital markets to be robust? Uh, you've talked about. Um, the uh, regulatory um, uh, the oversight um, and and standards, and you've talked about you've touched upon the, the very sensitive issues of of the politics of uh, of Brexit. So Brexit clearly has implications for the the future of clearing. Um, it also has implications for other aspects of the financial services business. 
And so I have a series of questions that I'd like to ask um, first Matthew and then Gay uh, that relate to other aspects of the uh, financial services business. Um, firstly, um, an issue that you touched upon, Matthew, will there be a broader equivalence deal between the UK and the EU? Um, and would an equivalence deal be uh, desirable? Um, secondly, which parts of the business, um, the financial services business, have already had to move from London to other locations? And which, if they haven't moved already, will likely have to move in the future? And then finally, which parts of the financial services business are still up for grabs? So let me turn to you first, Matthew, um, and then uh, and then over and then back over to Gay on those on those uh, on those issues. Sure, thanks, Rick. I mean, it's already pretty widely known how European equity trading uh, pretty much switched um, overnight. Uh, um, European uh, authorized uh, entities were not allowed to use. Um, UK equity trading venues. And so our client uh, transaction switched overnight from uh, UK venues into Europe. We've had to do a lot of other preparations in terms of creating a third country branch and narrowing down activities and making sure we've got the right uh, permissions. Um, I think a lot of it does depend on this question of equivalence, which, which as you know, is basically the European Union's rules of the game say, uh, we will assess whether another country, a third country, the UK is now a third country, they have sufficiently equivalent, sufficiently similar, doesn't have to be exactly similar rules as we've got in the EU, and then we will allow access into our markets and uh, trust your home supervision. And, and that's the way the rules are basically set up. I've actually got experience of this because, as you mentioned, I was the uh, chief executive of Bermuda, and Bermuda went through an equivalence assessment um, where we wanted to get equivalents for Solvency II. And it's a pretty rigorous exercise, a lot of questionnaires. Uh, it's not line-by-line -line assessment, but almost kind of paragraph-by-paragraph -paragraph assessment, pretty close to it, uh, about how comparable the rules in Bermuda are to the rules in the UK. And we got the equivalence assessment. It's, it's a clunky process, but it's the one that's out there. So the EU framework is, is pretty clear and uh, unfortunately, we're kind of stuck in an impasse right now where the equivalence process really hasn't kicked off because it's caught in the sort of tail of the bad politics of Brexit. I hope it does restart and get going again. There was maybe a little glimmer of hope in the news today that the MOU between the European authorities and the UK is about to be signed and there's a form for better dialogue. What it will require is an equivalence assessment um, market by market. Um, so it's a pretty fragmented process. I hope it's a technical one. I hope it's a regulator to regulator assessment and it can be depoliticized as much as possible. Maybe hard right now, but over time, hopefully that will happen. There's a couple of very clunky things in that. Uh, one is that equivalents can be turned off very quickly. Uh, I think there, there should be some changes to the rules of the game to provide more certainty. And then Europe has asked the UK to give some um, certainty about how its rules will look like in the future. That's a bit unrealistic, but I think it's fair to say, uh, as a quid pro quo, the UK would say whether or not it plans major divergence of rules in the following year. So uh, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I, I hope we can get a kind of spark and, and, and get this equivalence process working. Last thought, you don't need equivalence for all markets. It's not necessary. It's where it's cross-border and it's uh, important to the market participants. Then it's worth investing the time and effort. So maybe, hopefully, we'll see some equivalents. I don't think it's going to happen in clearing, but hopefully it'll happen in other areas instead. Okay, well, th thank you very much for, for, for those thoughts, Matthew. And Gay, I'd like to, to ask you essentially the same questions. Which parts of the business, from your vantage point, have, have you seen already having to move from London to other locations? And which do you think are likely to move in the future? And, and interestingly, which parts of the business are still up for, uh, for grabs? All right. Um, well, as, as, as Matthew said, I think the first day uh, first trading day of the year was pretty brutal. It was a recognition that this happened when you have about $5.6 billion worth of trades just moving out of London immediately into, into Europe. 
So that was kind of a wake up call. And the other side of it is, is the derivative trading that has not necessarily gone to Europe, it's, it's left toward New York. And, and, and so that, there's a region that stands to gain from the kind of, what do I want to call it, regions infight. So I, you know, that, that was quite brutal. But if we talk about the people, there was an estimation in the UK um, early on that probably we'd lose in the UK about 250,000 jobs because of the Brexit and the financial services. And E&Y just did a, a Brexit kind of their radar. And um, they came up and said the disruptive effects weren't quite as much. So far, we've only lost seven to 10,000 jobs. Now, is that because of COVID um, and, the, and the problems we've had going back and forth um, or not? So I think those are some of the things we have to, to think about in the future. Now, what we all know is about $1.2 trillion of capital and assets actually left London also just to go to establish the capital positions of many of the large institutions as they made their ways into cities such as Frankfurt and Paris and Dublin and Amsterdam and Lisbon. Um, so they could continue doing business with, with, with European clients. I mean, it was a sad case of something called, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but DPI cap, which is the world's um, largest inter-dealer broker. And it, it, for what, early on, early in January, they could, they said they couldn't serve any all of its EU clients because they just hadn't moved enough staff to Paris because of COVID. But sadly, the French regulators were unmoved by this, this request. So they had to have a temporary reprieve until the restrictions have eased. So th that's some of the issues that have happened, uh, sadly, over the period of time. I mean, it, the damage so far is not fatal to London, uh, but clearly it's early days. And what we hear is it's hearts and minds um, that people, that country national regulators, ECB, want in all of these various um, jurisdictions. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean just how, what kind of decision making? You know, what kind of has to be made? Um, and those are some of the things I think we're all still working through as we've moved our capital, we've moved some of the jobs, we've moved some of the decision making. And out of London into these European, you know, centralized places. So the question is, does this create more disruption in the long run? I understand why regulators want it. Being a former regulator, you like to know hearts and minds. But we created colleges so people could, you know, colleges of regulators, so they could get together and understand what's happening in the various subsidiaries and the jurisdictions around the world. But as I think you and Matthew said, this is a political decision. So. Um, that's kind of where we are today. Well, you know, that leads perfectly. I want to explore, it leads perfectly into the next question that I have, and I want to explore a bit more deeply some of the the issues that you just raised, Gay. And I'll start with you and then and then and then go to Matthew on the on the same points. Um, you talked about hearts and minds, and one of the things that strikes me so far is that some of the shifts that we've seen, not all, but some of the shifts of business from London uh, to the EU seem to me to be more ones of form than substance. It's, it's, um, it's booking centers, it's capital. Um, you know, will, will it be booking centers and capital shifting from London, but yet trading decisions and risk management continuing to be conducted um, from a central location in London um, across all of these, these booking centers? Um, will that be the, the um, will that be something that is the uh, effect of, of all of these changes? Will regulators and, and perhaps more importantly, political leaders in the UA, EU um, uh, accept that, um, if, if in fact that's what is happening. What are your thoughts on, uh, on that, Gay? And then, and then I'll ask Matthew the same. Well, it's, it's early days. I mean, I, as a, if you go back, the industry, I think, perspective was, it was less disruptive, but it's a real annoyance for firms, if <laughs> you just put it this way, um, than the media have found. I mean, firms, I, I believe through this whole process of hope for the best, but prepared for the worst. So that gives you a form says, you know, I, firms put the money, the effort, the activity into it to make sure they were prepared for anything. So they really wanted to avoid disruption. 
Um, and I can say that in the UK, the PRA and the Treasury and the FCL work with everybody to, to try to make, and they work with the, their, regu their, their regulators on the continent to try to find that right balance of what you're talking about. Because you can apply for your licenses, you can move the capital, as you said, you can move some of the people, but how do you make it work? And what you want is a functioning market system. And I, and I, and I clearly, this is a political game there where we've heard from many of Europeans saying, okay, where's the location gonna be? Because they're gonna want a financial enterprise. And what someone said to me, you know, back in the European days where the French owned the agricultural agenda, the Germans own the corporate agenda, the UK owned the financial services agenda. Well, they're no longer part of the EU in the way they were. And so there, there will be a place for somebody to win as the financial services agenda in the future. So I think this is, this is a time telling thing. Now we have been told hearts and minds, various decision-making making has to be done in these local jurisdictions. Risk management has to be done. You need somebody of senior importance. So everybody's moving people there. But if you move everybody, then you start bifurcating your ability to really manage your books. Now we go back to the derivatives days. If you've got 700 trillion or almost 700 trillion by the end of the year or so coming up in derivatives, you've got to know how to manage those books. You can't just manage them individually as well as you possibly can. It get back to the conduct. So I, I think as a regulator, most people like having it right there so you can talk to them, you have control. But as I go back to what I said earlier, those colleges of regulators work, were worked really well for a period of time, and they still exist where you bring people together and so you can share these experiences. Do so you know what's happening to the organization? And we're going to have, hopefully, some of that will happen. I mean, I am concerned about what the architecture of Europe is going to be for the future of financial services. I mean, with fragmentation, you lose a sense of scale. Um, <laughs> I hate to use this comment, but I, it's an EU official that said that the EU, many of them are you know, fighting like rats and sacks trying to take the lead in financial services. Yeah, I understand why that EU would want to do that, but I think that's part of a global picture because it won't be just EU jobs and UK jobs that are lost. Those jobs will be lost. They will be lost and they'll be lost to Asia and they'll be lost to the US. We're already seeing some of that happening. So we have to be conscious of that. I mean, rec we recognize there's a gap in Europe uh, and it needs to be filled. Um, but we've got to think about how, they've got to think carefully about how you can do it carefully without blowing out markets and making firms unmanageable. And that's what we need to do is we need to continue to manage that. So, and I think the other side of the voice we haven't heard is the customer voice. You know, what are the additional costs for, for extra, these extra layers? If you have multiple risk managers and multiple sites, and you have multiple books being run multiple ways with different capital requirements and loss of liquidity, you know, what happens? And Matthew spoke of the year clearing issue, but, um, you know, the end result is the end user picks up the extra cost. And that isn't good because it gets passed on to the consumer. It's not just a financial smart guy. It's the consumer at the end of the day who pays for it. So, so those are some of the things that affect me. I mean, that I worry about. I understand why we, what's being done but I just try to think, let's think it through. So the end result isn't that the customer has to pay more money and the firms don't blow up because it's more difficult to manage the risk and the conduct of their people. Much as I would really believe to think that people do the right thing, we have found out in many cases that doesn't happen. Well, Gay, you've highlighted a number of the complexities um, in, in, in all of these, these issues. Um, Matthew, I'm interested in, in any thoughts that, uh, that you would add to those of, of Gay on these points. Yeah, I think a very good analysis. I, I, I think it's, as Gay said, it's a matter of balance here as to what's to be expected of firms in terms of um, mind and management. So uh, certainly the ECB, uh, SSM senior management, have been very clear that they don't want brass plate operations where there is no substance in the eurozone and large booking volumes. Um, and they do look for mind and management and, and substance. And there's a history to this, which is uh, a lot of regulators got their fingers burned on this in, in the financial crisis, where try to accept a kind of global uh, approach and cross-border reliance. But then when the chips are down and problems occur, 
it's what's the legal entity in your country and is that in trouble and does it have enough capital and whose deposit insurance system is on the hook and whose taxpayers are on the hook. Um, I, Ireland, where I came in to be a supervisor there, had, had had its problems not just from the Irish banks but from cross-border entities in the Irish financial centre that uh, got into serious trouble and the size of their balance sheets you know, dwarfed that of the Irish GDP and economy. So what what regulators are looking for are the, are the things that Gay mentioned. You know, do you have the capital uh, in the country in a legal entity? Um, that's 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 part of it. As, as Gay had some interesting stats there about that some of that capital has moved out. Is there the infrastructure and the management in place to be able to manage the positions effectively? And and again, I agree with Gay. It's as a supervisor, you know, you want to have someone to talk to when the when the uh, chips are down. And, and problems are occurring, you know, trying to get through on the phone to home base and they're dealing with a lot of crises are very difficult. Um, you know, when I was in Bermuda, we had a local AIG entity. I could go around and talk to them right at the height of the crisis. Um, when I had a big insurance company come to get authorization in Ireland, I insisted on a certain local presence as well. But it's a matter of judgment and degrees. And exactly as Gay says, it gets too fragmented. So you 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 you, know, you want the capital there. You want a critical mass of people. You want the risk management function there. You want a local CEO. You want to be able to talk to the senior people from time to time. So it'll tend to be a negotiation ultimately between the firm and the supervisor to get the balance right. And, and hopefully the European authorities will strike that balance in a pragmatic way. Well, thank you, Matthew. And and you and Gay have both both talked about a number of the, the pitfalls, the risks, the, the concerns, fragmentation, um, trying to strike the right, right balance. Um, clearly, there are concerns that, that we all share um, throughout the market about uh, what the impact of, of this um, uh, current version of, of Brexit, this current no-deal version of Brexit for financial services will mean. Um, Gay, you, you touched upon some of the benefits that might accrue to jurisdictions outside of Europe and the UK, uh, mentioning uh, the, poss the possibility that, that uh, centers of gravity shift to back to the United States and also to, to Asia. Um, I, I'd like to ask both of you, starting with Matthew and then coming to, to, to you, Gay, whether there might be some offsetting benefits. We've talked a lot about the, the concerns and the, and the risks, um, but let me, let me look at it from both the UK and uh, EU perspective for a moment. There's been a lot of brave talk in the UK about how this will be a great thing for the UK because it will enable the UK to attract new businesses uh, to, the, to the UK because they'll have a regulatory flexibility perhaps if not um, tied to the, to the EU uh, that will enable London to attract new business. So might there be some offsetting benefits uh, to, the, to the UK? Um, from, the, from the EU perspective, um, might Brexit be the catalyst that finally pushes Europe to develop a single market for financial services? This is something that has been talked about for many, many years and decades, actually. Um, might this actually be, given the, the risks of fragmentation, the potential for loss of liquidity, um, the loss of uh, financial services business to other regions of the, of the world, uh, the Americas and, and, and Asia, might this be the catalyst that finally pushes Europe uh, to develop a, a single market for financial services? Let me start with, with you, Matthew, um, uh, based in the, in the EU, um, and, then, uh, and then turn to, uh, to, to Gay with, with, with that. Uh, question. Yeah, I think from from the UK perspective, just to connect it into equivalence a bit there, Rick. I think it's interesting how the, how the architecture of how equivalence might work out. That you don't need to have equivalence for all your markets. Indeed, for Bermuda, we sought it for the cross border business, not for the domestic business. So, I think there's there's something there which is that if if In domestic business and business with the EU, or even goes into three parts. You know, what's a domestic authorization, an authorization to do cross-border business into the EU, and business that doesn't touch the EU at all—that's completely wholesale. 
then then you can get you know horses for courses, different types of regulation for the different sectors. For those firms that want to do that cross-border business into the EU, then they're going to have to meet some sort of equivalence and be subject to evolving EU rules as they change over time. But if you're a domestic British firm just dealing with British citizens and not touching the EU, then you know there there is um, uh, burdensome aspects to EU regulation that are designed for cross-border activity that you know aren't going to be needed, and and perhaps also for wholesale business outside of the EU. So I think there's some some opportunities there. For, the, for Europe, yeah, maybe the, it gets a catalyst for the capital markets union. You know, possibly the people be uh, seeing um, the competitive aspect to make uh, the EU change its um, change its course. I, I worry about the UK's voice lost in the European corridors of power, if you like, the poli- political level, you know, to moderate some proposals that aren't so well thought through. And then as a former regulator, you know, the, the UK regulators were very influential and had a big role in the technical rule setting to get a sensible regulatory framework. So I think that's going to be lost. And, and, and I hope, um, you know, the European supervisory agencies and the European authorities, you know, um, uh, recognize that there's a need to invest in the authorities and, and to make sure that the proposals that come out of there are properly calibrated, uh, even though the UK voice isn't there. Thank you, Matthew. Gay, uh, your thoughts? A few more, I guess. Um, I guess, um, I think that, well, just up front, the changes resulting from breakfast will continue to unfold in years to come. So I'm sure this is, when we, we put this down in history and then we look another five, 10, even 25 years, we will see differences from now to then, but it'll be interesting to see what those results will be. I mean, and the MOU that and I have no inside information, um, but the Brus- Brussels made pretty per- perfectly clear that you know an agreed MOU will not automatically lead to more EU access from London's finance industry be- beyond the time limited you know permission that Matthew talked about is to clear EU derivatives contracts. So it'll be interesting for all of us to re to read that when it comes out. Um, the EU, you know, I think Matthew talked about the burdensome aspect of it. I, I have talked about it also. It's really going down quite a punitive approach uh, and putting up barriers. And people and markets have long memories uh, and customers are mobile. And, and there's also something called muscle memory. Muscle memory, the organic thing is, you know, people keep going back to, to, to London. You know, that has been an international place for people to do business and it will continue to do so. And and since we're talking about involvement, I mean, the London markets are talking about, you know, this is where the, the treasury and everybody else is saying, can you do more in green finance? Can you do more in the sustainability forums? You know, what's the approach to data collection, you know, FinTech funding, um, Jonathan Hill, Lord Hills just put a paper out on listing in terms of how, you know, the stock markets and how, you know, wh- where can the UK, which has always had gold plate as a certain part of its marketplace, how can they attract to be more competitive in the marketplace? So you, you're going to see more of that happening, more innovation circles. Um, the, the UK is not going to be retaliatory. Um, that's kind of an element they've set up front. Uh, but history tells us that London, you know, will thrive, you know, how is it going to thrive? Is it going to thrive that equity, you know, European equity markets are ever going to come back to the UK? Probably not, but there'll be other markets. And those markets is what the UK is going to, going to force, a, for, you know, is basically going to force through or create or try to find an ability to have that happen. Um, interesting statistic I read one where, which we talk about all the banks, you know, setting up operations in Europe and gaining licenses. And I don't have the number of how many that is. But 1,500 EU-based financial services have applied to operate in the UK. Now, 1,000 of these firms, they say, will be establishing their first UK office. So it's got to go the reverse in some ways. Not quite, you know, we've been really much more open in the UK and Andrew Bailey and the Bank of England are allowing business to transact this way. But I think it'll be interesting to see how that, that falls out in the future. And... I, you know, at the moment, you talked about the other jurisdictions. I think, you know, U.S. has already gained on the derivatives business, uh, and that could continue to be more so. China, 
will be a real winner. I mean, it's a big marketplace and more people want to get into China, no matter what is happening around there. And India, India has always been that element. Um, you know, it has some closed markets and it's, and it's, but it's got a big marketplace and it continues to expand. I had a meeting this morning with some, there's something called Gift City in Gujarat, established by Prime Minister Modi. And they are, you know, they just did a virtual tour of the UK today. And it was quite interesting in terms of their plan for a financial services center, center in India. So I think we're going to see a lot more advancement. Um, I, you know, I wish the EU well, but I do wish that they work well with organizations because in the end, the results are if you split liquidity across very large markets, it's not efficient for firms to run their risk. And that is not great for financial stability in the long run. So those are some of my thoughts. Well, thank you, Gay and, and Matthew, both. I mean, there are lots of concerns. There's reason for hope and optimism. And there's a lot that, that, that we don't know. And through the, the common thread throughout all of, of your remarks is that politics will, will play a role. And that leads us nicely into the first question that we've received from our audience, it comes from Bruce Bennett at Covington in New York. And Bruce asks, um, he says that there've been several references in, in our remarks to rules, how rules and procedures should change regarding equivalence. And while those may be accurate observations objectively, what leverage is available to in fact convince the EU to agree? Um, Matthew, why don't I uh, uh, start with, uh, with you and get your thoughts on that? What leverage uh, exists to get the EU to agree, if any? Um, I'm not sure if there's a massive amount of leverage. I mean, it is in, in ultimately in mutual self-interest to have some sort of equivalence deals in, in some of these markets um, because there is cross-border uh, flows. I think, as as Gay said earlier, the, the fragmentation of liquidity it, it's painful for European firms as well as for UK firms, and um, uh, you know that, that's why I'm I'm looking very closely to see what this technical group and the Commission comes up with on LCH equivalents. That uh, there is this objective to try to transfer positions. Uh, but you know, there's basis risk between the two clearinghouses, fragmented liquidity, um, uh, extra costs involved. So let's see what the roadmap is that gets through all that, and is it really better than giving the LCH extended temporary equivalence? My optimistic side, and it's a bit hard in post-Brexit to be an optimist on some of these things. My optimistic side says that you know, after the dust settles and the politics goes down, the um, you know regulator to regulator contacts will be able to carve out some equivalents for some of these different markets. But right now, it's stuck. So um, I'm not sure I see a lot of leverage and it moving anytime soon. I'm afraid to be a bit of a pessimist. Yay, any any thoughts of yours to add? Uh, I, I can't add anything different. I mean, this is a political process and it's gonna take time to resolve. I, I, the economics and politics of the decision are really in conflict. Parties are all conflicted. The UK wants the right to diverge, which it's done. The EU needs to share there isn't a benefit. Um, we're gonna have difficulties in the near term, but in the relationships, you know, they haven't been very pretty. I mean, they're not. They're not very cordial and collegiate right now. I hope we get to a point that they will be uh, in the future. And I don't believe financial services are going to get the equivalence anytime soon. And I, and I hate to say that, um, but I think it's something the city of London worked very hard on. And then they finally woke up and, and they, they realized they didn't get it. The Treasury, UK Treasury, realized up front that wasn't going to happen. And they sort of set it out differently and said, OK, we have to have autonomy. And how is that going to work? I mean, the losers, as I went back earlier, is the consumer. And that's who we've got to be thinking about at all point in time. But when you get into politics, is it always the consumer? And the consumer voice hasn't been heard enough. If it gets so expensive and so ugly that that happens, then perhaps we'll have a wake-up call and maybe a better equivalence will be allowed. 
Okay, that leads nicely into the next question, which you talked about. I mean, you quite rightly highlighted the impact on the consumer and on, and that means the, the the broader economy, the costs that can be imposed or would be imposed as a result of fragmentation. And we've talked about the interests of the banks and the interests of the regulators and the interests of the of the political leaders and the various jurisdictions in the and you know in the EU and the UK and elsewhere. What about the impact on individuals? Um, people who um, um, are being uprooted from London and needing to move uh, to the to the EU, to what extent will their concerns be be taken into account? And I can add a, a personal anecdote. One of my one of my French uh, colleagues, based in London, said he wants to stay in London. His family is in London. His kids are in school in London. Um, he, he's built a life in London. He loves Paris, loves going home to visit, but doesn't want to live there. W will, will, will their interests be taken into account or will, they, will, will that reluctance on the part of some individuals to move and uproot them themselves, will that play a role? And Gay, um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think if you're a banker, I don't think anybody cares. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 you know, they're in tax, we've been hearing about tax benefits that have been offered to um, many firms for their individuals. Um, so is that fair play, fair game? I, you know, that's, just, that's another world for me. Um, so I, I do think there is an upset. There are people who are moving the, the, to areas in Europe and they are leaving their families in London at this point in time. And that's sad. And there are other people who are up, uprooting and they're just moving. And there are others who are just, it's, it, it's difficult. I mean, I, I, get, I get back to the consumer. The, act, the banker themselves, don't know nobody's going to worry about. But it's, it's, the, it's the, the little guy. You know, it's the corporate that's going to pay more money because if you're clearing changes, it's, netting is cost efficient. And so that affects the corporate customer. Well, if they start paying more money, they're not allowed. That passes itself onto the customer. If we get a point in time where we have large financial institutions and you have different books and we have a, another financial crisis, and gosh, you know, I hope we don't, um, then at that point in time, we will have to, you know, that gets picked up by the taxpayer. So those are the, the concerns I actually have uh, that are a little concerning to me. Well, thank you, Gay. And, and Matthew, I could go to you on this question, but I'm not sure where your sympathies actually lie, given that you were based for a number of years in and around London, have a, you know, continue to, to, to have a home in London, but yet you managed to move quite, quite successfully to Helsinki and as, and as I understand it, are thoroughly enjoying um, both your professional and personal life in, uh, in Helsinki. Um, but perhaps I should move on to the, to, to the next question, unless you want to take issue with what I just said. But um, No, nope, that's fine. Okay. Question comes from Roger Kogan. Um, and, and Matthew, I think I'll, I'll let you, you deal with this. And Matthew is, is head of European policy for ISDA based in Brussels. And Roger asks, he says, there's been plenty of attention to where derivatives trading is done, but little publicly, at least until recently, on the impact on EU firms of clearing location policies and mutual refusal of derivatives trading obligation equivalents. Which European policymakers, which should European policymakers be more concerned about? Matthew, your thoughts. I think the uh, the derivatives clearing has has uh, a lot of practical impacts, um, both for corporates that are obliged to clear into margin positions and for um, banks as as well. It, it's it's viewed as quite a technical issue, but um, uh, you know I, I think it's uh, it's one that deserves more attention. It gets it a bit, you know, it bubbles up in the FT every now and then. Um, but, uh, you know, the fragmented liquidity effect, are we really going to require all our corporate customers to repaper their positions? Um, is there going to be a, a cost to kind of eat the basis risk when you transfer positions across? Um, uh, all those all those things, you know, less efficient uh, portfolio management with fragmented liquidity. Um, it, it's got the potential to, to be you know, a self-inflicted wound for European banks, uh, unless there's a path through it that could be done with minimal cost. And, I, and I'm, I'm a bit dubious about that. So uh, I, I, I hope that, you know, you know, the LCH equivalents could be extended. That, that would be the rational thing to do in all this. But, um, you know, uh, in, in, in Brexit, um, politics trumps uh, 
sensible thinking sometimes. So we shall have to see. But I think that's uh, that should be put higher up the agenda, as the questioner implies. Well, th thank you. Uh, sadly, we're 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 running out of time, and I think this next question I'm going to raise, but I'm not going to to. I don't think we can attempt to answer this one. I think this is going to be the subject for another prime finance uh, session because I think we could spend at least an hour on this next next question. So let me raise the question, um, but but we will not attempt to answer it. And the question is: If business shifts from London to the EU twenty seven might some dispute resolution follow as well? For many good reasons, English law continues to be the most widely used governing law in financial market agreements, and the English courts continue to be the jurisdiction of choice for many disputes. However, ISDA has published Irish law and French law versions of its master agreement. Does this represent a first step in a shift or will London retain its overwhelmingly leading role? There's obviously a lot in that question. And as I suggested, I think we will defer that uh, both in the interests of time and also because we could certainly spend an hour on that question. I think we will defer that question to a future uh, primetime uh, session uh, in which we can take up that, that very interesting question. But we have covered a lot of of ground in this conversation. We've highlighted uh, both opportunities and concerns um, from the perspective of the market, from the perspective of regulators, from the perspective of the users of the, of the capital markets, and obviously from the perspective of, of, of political actors. Um, we could go on certainly for a long time, but as Gay said, we'll probably be talking about Brexit for many, many years uh, to, uh, to come. So we appreciate uh, all of the excellent questions that have come uh, from uh, the, the audience, and, and we certainly appreciate your tuning into this program. Before I turn the program back to Camilla McPherson, I'd like to thank Gay and Matthew for joining me today. It's been both a personal pleasure for me and also highly informative uh, for me, um, and I expect for our audience as well. So thank you both very much. And now, Camilla, um, back over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone out there for sticking with us uh, through a bit of interference at the beginning. Um, now, to find out more about upcoming sessions of prime time, please do take a look at our website. We've already sent the details of the next two sessions around. They're both open for registration now. On 30th of March, we have Sustainable Finance, a Transatlantic Dialogue featuring Dame Elizabeth Pauley, Eric Pan and Ida Levine moderating. And then on 6th of May, we have Mediation and Financial Services featuring Jalita Panjaitan, Tony Piazza, Katerina Yianibas and Judge Elizabeth Strong moderating. So please do sign up and join us for those sessions. Uh, thank you again to Dwarf Financial Technologies and FTI Consulting for sponsoring this series of Prime Time. If you are interested in sponsoring a future event, please do get in touch. Prime Finance accepts donations through Friends of Prime to support its work. If you'd like to make a donation or find out more, please contact the Secretariat using the details that came up in the chat box or contact me directly. And thank you very much everyone for joining and to all of our panel. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>